you know, uh, <laughs> that I shouldn't tell lies, that I shouldn't steal, that I shouldn't commit sexual immorality, so on and so forth. But I wanted to believe that grace was my escape, that grace was my excuse, that uh, that the word of God was uh, usable to excuse my behavior instead of improve my behavior. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so that the righteousness never appealed to me. I didn't know anything about righteousness. Uh, it was not for a long time before I began to understand what righteousness even was. Yeah. Uh, but I knew a lot about what was wrong. And I realized that once I started wanting to stop doing what was wrong, I began to understand what righteousness was. Yeah. And then I met people. Yeah. People who were doing things that were righteous. Yeah. That were really righteous. Yeah. And that gave me an example of this righteousness. You know? Yeah. And brothers, whether you understand this or not, this thing that we do right here every Sunday is an example of that. Yeah. Jesus Christ says, go ye among all nations, teaching them the gospel. Yeah, you know what the gospel is? It's just simply the good news. Yeah, that's all it is, brother. It's the good news. Jesus Christ died for our sins that we can be forgiven if we should believe on him. Yeah, that's the good news, man. Yeah. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For those who receive this good news and want to be a part of this grace, man. Yeah. We take them down here to the river and we baptize them. Yeah. So that they can begin their journey uh, of this faith, man, towards these works that Christ commands us to. Because it is Christ who commands us in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, to believe and be baptized to be saved. Yeah, that's what he says. Yeah. Right. And then to those people who are serious, to those people who are genuine. We go to teach them all things that's been commanded of us because you know, brothers, it's not enough to come to Christ, but you must also continue with Christ. And there's a way to do that. Yeah. That milk is going to bring you close so that you can receive Christ, but what are you going to do the rest of your life? If you don't know what he says to do, then you're not going to do what he says. And if you don't do what he says, how are you going to be able to follow him? I, I'm just asking, brothers. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. And so that this thing that we do right here is an example of that. And I have, I, I think I boasted in the Lord last week. Last week was our seventh year anniversary at this parking lot at least. And then I said that the only reason that that was possible was because God, God has provided all this time for us to never have been without. God has touched our lives in such a way that we could physically be here every Sunday for the last seven years. Now, just thinking about that, brothers, that's all I'm asking. Just think about that. What are the chances of that? Don't you know that every Sunday that goes by, the probability that we're not going to be here next week increases exponentially? Yeah. Okay. And yet, here we are. <laughs> it is because of God. When we trust in the Lord, and we acknowledge him and the things that he does. He does all the things that he says he's going to do. Yeah. But first, I got to put what God says not to do away from me. Let's get to some scripture here. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. It says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You know, and that just destroys so many people's outlook and perspective. Firstly, there's no such thing as good works. Yeah, no such thing. Because you can't earn your salvation. So there's no such thing as good works. Because if I try to do good works, then that means I'm trying to earn my salvation. No. It's not how it works, brothers. We believe what God says. That's called faith. We don't just believe He exists, but we believe what He says. And when He tells us to do something, we believe it. Remember, righteousness was accounted unto Abraham because he believed God. And he obeyed, didn't he? What about Noah? 
You might go story the flood. Remember, God told Noah the water was going to fall from the sky. Noah didn't know what water falling from the sky was. Never seen water fall from the sky because water had never fallen from the sky yet. And yet, he believed God. Didn't he? How do we know Noah believed God? He built the boat. He built the boat. That's how we know. God told him to build it because water was going to fall from the sky and he built the boat. Now my question to you is, brothers, what saved Noah? <laughs> no, they don't like to hear this one. Yeah. Was it God's warning only? Or was it God's warning and Noah's obedience? If he hadn't built the boat, he'd have got washed away, wouldn't he? I'm just saying, brothers. Yeah, there you go, right there. Faith. I do these things because I believe God. Not because I'm trying to earn my salvation. I believe God. Remember James chapter 2. One man says he has faith. Another man says he has works. I say, show me that faith without that works. And I will show you my faith by my works. The just shall live by faith. Brothers, you've always lived by faith. Your whole entire lives, you have lived by faith. You have lived by what you believe. Don't you? What you believe to be right, you did. And what you believe to be wrong, you didn't do. Until you saw an opportunity that it would uh, uh, increase you or benefit you. And then all of a sudden it went wrong no more. Yeah. All right, brothers. That the man of God may be perfect. Ooh. Oh, man, can't nobody be perfect. Only Jesus was perfect. Nobody can be perfect. Yeah. What do you think about that? What is perfection? Is it what everybody out here says it is? Or is it what God says it is? Who do you serve? Who do you follow? Does Jesus Christ not wash away our sins? Am I not clean? White as snow? How would you be spotted again? If you went and you built again the thing that was destroyed by Christ when he washed you clean. That's how. That's how. So, we can be clean. We better be clean. We better hope we can be clean, brothers. But will you remain that way? That the man of God. You know, brothers, I, I struggled, man. I was an orphan. I didn't have no parents. I grew up in state custody. I didn't really have no male figure in my life to teach me much. And uh, I remember, man, from the time I turned 18 until I got up in my 30s, man, I was a question in my mind. Am I a man? When am I a man? I knew turning 18 didn't make me a man. I was that smart at least. But when am I a man? I'm going to go ahead and shed some light on this for you, brothers. Yeah. Firstly, you got to be a man of your word. Meaning that you keep your word. When you give it, you keep it. Because, brothers, nobody can trust a liar. Think about that. Secondly, you're going to have to be a man of your work. A man of your work. Meaning your ethic. Your breath. Into every single thing you put your hand to. Yeah. Because, brothers... Nobody can depend on a sorry ass. You're the only one that can make you lazy. Don't you understand? And brothers, whether you know this or not, God hates a sluggard. Yeah. People can deny you opportunity, brothers. Yeah. But that don't make you lazy. Lastly, and most importantly, brothers, you're going to have to be a man of faith. Yeah. How are you going to call yourself a man if you don't recognize the one that calls you men? Maybe that's the reason why people don't know if they're boys or girls right now. What do you think? I'm just saying. It's pretty evident, isn't it? Yeah. There you go, brothers. That the man of God. These are the things that we need to work on to be that man. So that we can be perfect. And thoroughly furnished. Meaning ready. 
Because brothers, God's going to provide whatever you need to do, whatever it is that He's told you to do. Don't you understand? But how are you going to know what that is? If you haven't studied to show yourself approved. All right. Are you going to know what God says, brother? If you don't go to him and find that. You're going to be like some of these folks go up to a church house and just sit and listen to that loud mouth. Believe what he says. Brothers, that's called laziness in case you didn't know. Yeah. I'll be honest with you, brothers. After hustling on the street, I don't trust nobody with nothing of mine. Nothing. Sure not my salvation. I'm going to get in there and find that out for myself. All right. My brothers, these are things to hold on to, man. Matthew chapter 5, verses 48 through 30, or 43 through 48. Listen to what Jesus says. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate that enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you only, what reward have you? Do not even the sinners do the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the sinners do the same. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Mm. Mm. We think about that. We think Jesus is telling you to do something you can't do. What kind of king is that? I'm just asking. Don't you know we're going to get punished for not doing what we're told to do? Isn't that what punishment's all about? So, why would he be telling you to do something that's impossible for you? That's pretty twisted, isn't it? I'm just saying, would you do your kids that way? Would you tell them that they were going to do something and if they didn't do it, they were going to get whooped for not doing it? No, they weren't able to do it. All right. You don't think God is at least as good a daddy as you? Brothers, it's possible. You are commanded. It's not a suggestion. You are commanded. Be ye therefore perfect. Even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Like God. Remember, I said that in the welcoming, didn't I? Our whole purpose here in this world is to learn how to be like God. Jesus gave us a very great description about something of God, didn't he? He said that his Son rises on the evil and the good. Everybody's getting the benefit of the light, brothers. Those people who are good and those people who are not good. He said he maketh his reign on the just and the unjust. Well, brothers, I know y'all don't know this, but reign is a blessing for obedience in the law. That's what it is. A blessing. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Check that out. Yeah. And yet, those people who were not obedient were getting the blessing of the rain alongside of those who were. Why? Why? You don't think God couldn't keep the rain off of their parcel of land while it rained on everybody else's? Why were they getting it? Because God loves even his enemies. And brothers, when we're in disobedience to God, we're his enemy. Because we oppose him. If you do what God says not to do, that means you don't believe what God says. Which puts you in opposition to God. And when you oppose one, that is your enemy. That's why we oppose them. Don't you know? You might not ever thought about you were God's enemy. You wouldn't think about being his enemy on purpose. But that's what you were. That's the position that you put yourself in when you don't believe what he says because he has given you every reason to believe everything he says. Look around yourselves, boys. Man can't do this. Man can neither create nor destroy anything. What do you think about that? 
Man can't take nothing and turn it into something. And they can't take something and make it into nothing. It'll always exist, brothers. Might change its state. Might break it down to its smallest particles, but they still exist. Brothers, that's got to be proof enough. Surely to goodness. I know. Big Bang. Evolution. I get it. Let's look at that. Big Bang. What is that? That's when something came from nothing with a big ball of light. That's what it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Let there be light. Burn! Everything from nothing. That's all I'm asking. Isn't that easy to comprehend? All right, brothers. He's giving you every reason to believe everything that he says. It's time to stop being God's enemy, brothers, and it's time to start looking towards God to be like God. And it begins with not doing what God doesn't do. Yeah. God ain't up there telling you not to tell lies while he goes around and tells lies. He's telling you not to tell lies because he cannot lie. This is how we are like him. If we act like him because whether you know this or not what you are not that meat sack that you're wearing but that spirit that resides within it is made in God's image yeah all right it's time to take a little pride man that's all I'm saying you didn't come from no daggone monkey you was made in God's image I don't know about you brothers but I it feels a whole lot better to think about, doesn't it? I'm just saying, doesn't that, doesn't that make you feel a little better? <sighs> All right, brothers. All right. So Jesus is commanding us to be perfect. And the example that he's giving of us to this is love. Love. Yeah. That we would love even our enemies. And brothers, I know you may not understand this or not, but loving our enemies is the pinnacle of what love is. Yeah. I'm thinking here in a few weeks we're going to have that message. Because uh, I look around and I see a lot of new faces. Yeah. This time we understand these things. Brothers, when you know this or not, this is the biggest problem in the world today. Nobody knows what love is. I got no idea what love is. I mean, look at how that's working out. I'm just saying. Love. Love is the pathway to this perfection, brothers. Yeah. Look. Let's look at some people who came to Jesus. Matthew 19, 16 through 21. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. And that is God. But if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said unto him, Which one? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I have yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Mm. You know, brothers, I don't know how or why people think it is that they're going to work around God's commandments. That they're not going to have to do these things. That they're not going to have to keep these things. Do you understand? Yeah. I say this because I was one of those people. I'm just saying, I was one of those people, man. I got grace, right? I mean, I've got grace, man. Forever. All I see, I got grace. What does it matter? Yeah, all right. Yeah, last week, we learned that grace was the forgiveness of sins in the past. The moment that you call on Jesus Christ, the moment that you accept Jesus Christ, the moment that you begin to believe, you get this grace, man. And from that moment, Past, all washed away, cast in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. But brothers, 
future is not past. Hold on to that. Yeah. This young man came up and he was trying to vote you signal. Yeah, yeah. He's trying to vote you signal. He came up with Jesus and he wanted to know what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus told him to keep the commandments. Well, which one? You see what I'm saying? He said, keep the commandments. Not a commandment, but the commandments. And he wanted to know which one. Yeah. So Jesus just starts naming these commandments up, man. You know, it would have taken him a long time to recite every commandment. Yeah. But I think the young man got the idea and he just cut him off. Well, yeah, I've done this all my life. What lack I yet? Hmm. Sounds like he didn't have too much confidence, did he? You know, brothers, it's our duty to approach the throne of grace with boldness. Boldness. And that man went too bold. Why? Because he knew he was lacking something. He had it. He knew it because he didn't feel it right here. Yeah. And Jesus told him, well, if you want to be perfect, go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. Most for a long time, I thought that was what I was going to have to do. Of course, in the moment that I came into submission, like some of you are in this moment, yeah, I was living in a tent with nothing but a sleeping bag. So, you know, I really didn't have too much to give to anybody. Yeah. So, I really didn't have to worry too much about that. But later on, I came to understand something. Remember, brothers, there's two kinds of people that find the kingdom of heaven. There's those people who are seeking it. And then there are those people who just stumble upon it, like many of you, going to the human place and stumble upon this meeting called Prison of Praise. But when these people found the kingdom of heaven, they both did the same thing to obtain it. They sold all that they had. They gave everything up for this one thing. Yeah. But listen, Jesus told that rich man that he was going to have to sell everything that he had and give it to the poor. Yeah. What he told him was is he needed to forsake this world. And that is what you're going to have to do, brothers. You are going to have to forsake this world and the things of this world, the ways of this world, the dreams of this world. They've got to go. they got to go, brothers. Because they will stand in your way. You'll be the seed that's been planted among the weeds and the thorns. Because you still have cares of this world. Oh, you'll walk away from here feeling good. You'll get some strength, man. You'll start growing. You might even start reading the Bible, man. And then when you get out of the program, you got to get a job. And you got to get a place to live. You got to have a car. You got to have insurance. You got to have all these things. But what happens? If you kick Jesus to the curb. I need to tell this little lie. I need to forge my time sheet. I'm just saying, brothers, on and on and on with the things that we will do for our benefit in this world because of the cares that we have of this world. You gotta forsake it, brothers. It's got to go. That's not gonna be easy. Let's go ahead and put that out there, brother. Just in case any of y'all misunderstand me. I will never, and I have never, and will never tell you that any of these things will ever be easy because it's going to require the death of yourself. Everything about yourself has to go. Pick up your cross and come follow me. Forsake the world and come follow me. If thou wilt be, if thou wilt be perfect, forsake this world and come follow me which means they become his disciple that's what we're all being called to each and every one of us to be his disciple to come and follow him to do what he does the way that he does it for the same reasons that he does it we don't have no agenda no more I don't have no motive. I don't, I'm not going to use this pathway as a way of getting myself a new house and a new car and blah, 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 because I think God's going to answer my prayers and give me all the stuff that I want. No. 
I'm doing this so that I can be raised up at the last day. That is it. Because I love the one who first loved me. Brothers, hold on to that. All right. So I told you to keep the commandments. Or keep the commandments, forsake the world, and come follow me. To inherit eternal life and to be perfect, we keep the commandments, we forsake this world, and we follow Christ. Which is everything that I've been telling you these past few weeks, brothers. In order to do righteous and have righteousness accounted unto you, you first must put sin away from you. Keep the commandments. Then righteousness can be accounted unto you when you begin to follow Christ. Yeah. But that's not going to happen if we don't forsake the world, brothers. Every time you see some benefit in the world, you ain't going to care one bit about doing what God says or not doing what God says. Because you care more about that dollar or whatever it is that you is glittering before your eyes more than you care about God. That's what it was for me for a long time, brothers. Long time. Listen here now. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. You know, the problem that I had, like I said already, was that I believed that Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law for us. That, you know, he, he, he made it to, a, to such a way that we didn't have to keep God's law no more. That, that in fact, there was no law no more because Christ fulfilled it. You see what I'm saying? All we had to do was love. Love, right? Because that's what he told the other who were with him. Which is the greatest commandment? To love God with all your might, all your heart, and all your mind. And to love that neighbor as thyself. I mean, you know, it's surprising how many people know that. Unfortunately, they don't know what love is. But let's come back to the commandments first. We'll jump there next. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. Jesus says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law. Or... The prophets, which is the prophecies, right? That's what the prophets did. They came with messages from God about future things to people. Yeah. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever shall therefore break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men to do so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, like I said, Oh my man, well Christ fulfilled the law. Because that's what he said, right? He said, I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. Only he didn't say what he fulfilled. He said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law. Or the prophets. I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the prophets. Anybody know how many prophecies Christ fulfilled? Random number, roundabout number? Over 300. Over 300 prophecies that are in this book given by the prophets to the Hebrew people did Christ fulfill. Brothers, don't you know it's impossible to fulfill the law? As in, once it's fulfilled, nobody has to keep it? That would be like us going out here because I kept 30 KRS statute. None of you guys would have to keep it. Don't you understand? We know better than that. You need a guy. No, brothers. Because he said that the law would not pass away until heaven and earth pass away. And brothers, whether you understand this or not, I hope to think that you know that because we're all still here. Who hasn't passed away? In fact, not one dotted I or cross T in the law will change. Yeah. And that whoever should break these commandments and teach others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth them and teaches others to do them shall be called great 
Now, brothers, I don't know about you, but uh, I think I would much rather prefer if I had a choice to be called great over least. Just, yeah, think about that. What do you think the least are going to be? Ooh, okay. The important part here, brothers, is that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom. Hmm. Don't you think that would be a little impossible seeing as how our righteousness is as a filthy rag? So is theirs, don't you know? They're not better than we are. If they've sinned, then they're not better than we are and all have sinned. What was the problem with the Pharisees, brothers? What was their issue? They believed that as long as they sacrificed animals and committed themselves to the rituals of the law, that they were righteous. They never took into consideration all the things that they did that God said not to. Never. Not once. Yeah. They weren't unrighteous because they told lies. They were righteous because they sacrificed the animals. Do you understand? It's not unlike Christianity today. Matter of fact, it's exactly the same. Lots of people going up here to the institution believe that they're righteous because of Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Without ever considering the sin that they commit day in and day out. Do you understand? You see how that is, brothers? Don't that make so much sense? Brothers, I'm going to tell you something now. I'm going to tell you something right now. I hope you're listening. The death of Jesus Christ on this cross will not make you righteous. No. It's merely the atonement for your sins. That's it. That's all it is. It will lead you to the narrow path. But you still got to walk it out. I remember you got left in this world. Think about that. Remember, Romans chapter 3, verse 26 through 28, the three components of salvation. Grace, the forgiveness of sins that are past, which is God's decision to do. The blood of Jesus Christ, which is the atonement for our sin. And three, faith. Your faith that you would live by. Do you understand? Believe God or not. Because if you do, then you're going to obey. You see how that works, brothers? Without either one of these three things, you're not going to make it. And only one or two of these three things, you're not going to make it. Yeah. This is what Christ is trying to tell us, brothers. This is how we shall surpass the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. We not only take thought for the sacrifice, but we take thought for the things that we do or don't do, depending on the case. Yeah. All right. All right, brothers. Hold on to that. Hold on to that. Yeah. All right. Uh, First John chapter two verses one through six. My little children, these things that I write unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, as he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Okay. This brothers. If you're genuine, if you have true faith, you know what that is? You don't know everything that you need to believe yet. But in your heart, you're ready to believe what God says. Yeah. You're not going to stop sinning overnight. But if your faith is genuine, when we do sin, when we do make a mistake, when we do fall on our face, when we do fall weak, we have an advocate, brothers. We have an advocate with the Father. 
Jesus Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father is our advocate. What is he advocating? Is he advocating how sorry you are? Or is he advocating saying, nah, he ain't sorry, man. He's just going to keep doing this again and again and again because he's going around telling everybody it don't matter. He's got grace. Turns down what I'm saying. Why would he advocate for you if that's your behavior? He advocates for you because of the sorrow that you carry on your heart for what you have done against God. Because he knows. He's right there. He's right there with you. He knows. All right. Yeah, in that case, we have an advocate, brothers. But if that's not the case, brothers, then it ain't doing us no good. Because there's nothing for him to advocate. Your lawyer defends you in court, doesn't he? But he needs some things. He wants to hear some things about you, doesn't he? He wants you to hear some good things about you. Things that he can use to advocate for you, to soften your signature, change the judge's mind. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what an advocate does. Christ knows, brothers. Christ knows. All right. All right. So then, if we say we know him, and we don't keep his commandments, then we are a liar. Why? Well, because we're living by what we believe. And if we don't keep his commandments, then that proves we don't believe him. All right. All right. Brothers, I just wanted to be used by God. I, I got tired of having a, a purposeless life. I got tired of hurting people. I wanted to help people. I wanted to be useful. I wanted to have a purpose. I wanted all my wrong to have a purpose so that though I did carry that shame, I could hold my chin up. And the way to do that, brothers, was to be used by God. And I asked God, I said, Lord, if you're not going to use me, just get rid of me. I don't even want to be here. But it was up to me to drive that desire for sin out of my heart. And it's going to be up to you, brothers. Listen now. Listen now. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted that God is doing this to me. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. Death. Do not err. My beloved brethren, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried. Everybody remember in Hebrews chapter 11, and the scripture says, when Abraham was tried, what did Abraham do when he was tried? God asked him to offer his son on the altar as a sacrifice. And what did Abraham do when he was tried? He did what God said, didn't he? This is how we endure temptation, brothers. Your flesh is weak. There are things that it wants. But we endure this temptation so that when we are tried, we are found to be faithful. Faithful. Faithful, brothers. Do you understand the difference? Yeah. If you got a woman, a wife, and she's faithful to you, what is she not doing? Not going out on the issue. If you're faithful to God, what are you not doing? You're not going out on Him serving some other something or other. God, your belly, money, world, whatever. Where it goes. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. And when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. 
Last week we heard that faith cometh by the hearing. And that that hearing has to be the word of God. That when we truly hear the word of God, yeah, and we desire it in our hearts, that is the seed of faith being planted within you, brothers. And we also said that lust is planted within us through the eyes by what we see. And when we see it and begin to want it, to desire it, to lust for it, then the seed of lust is planted. Remember, the eye is the lamp of the body. What the eye seeks to see is what the body will be full of, whether that be light or whether that be darkness. All right? So then, brothers, you are not tempted by anything that you do not first desire. Ooh, I think I can prove this. Yeah, how many addicts we got here? Mm, I'll just get yeah, how many? All right. You was out on a mission. Maybe you like heroin. Maybe you like cocaine. Maybe you like meth. Maybe you like fentanyl. I don't know, but you had a drug of choice. You had the money. You went on a mission. You found both men, but he didn't have what you wanted. What did you do? You kept going, didn't you? You kept going till you found it. Because you were not tempted by anything else. Because you didn't desire that. Well, listen, the same is going to be true of every single thing that God says not to do. Wipe that desire out of your heart. Put it to death. You may not be able to put that flesh to death just yet, but you can drive it from your heart by wanting something else, something more. The power of the Holy Spirit, brothers, will drive it from your flesh. That's the power that we're seeking. That's the power that we've admitted we don't have. All right? All right, brothers. Don't give up. Don't give up. You're not going to battle and overcome your flesh overnight, brothers. You're not. I told you this last week. You're not going to be able to do that. But what you can do, brothers, what you can do is change your desire. Right here. That's what you can do. I don't want to be a drug addict no more, man. I'm tired of sticking needles in my arm. I don't want to go and steal no more. I'm tired of going to jail. I'm tired of people thinking that about me. That's not who I want to be anymore. I'm not ever going to do that again. That's where it starts. Who are you calling on to help you with that? That's what I'm asking. Who are you calling on to help you with that? And can they do that for you? Ooh. That scripture is Matthew chapter 11, verses 27 to 30. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son except the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, brothers, one of the things that kept me from, from putting sin away from me, yeah, all the thoughts about telling lies and being dishonest, man, and, and, and having dishonest scales, unbalanced scales, so that I could gain, gain, gain. The thing that kept me from doing that was the thought of all the things that I was going to lose. Or all the things I might not be able to have. Or all the things that wouldn't be right for me to do or have anymore. Yeah. That's what stopped me. Yep. Jesus said, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. Brothers, God places us in Jesus Christ's hands. Yeah. I know it seems like we come find Jesus or we come looking for Jesus. I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Because we got to call upon him. We got to believe on him. I get it. Yeah. But brothers, it is God who has chosen you. 
Jesus said in John chapter 15, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bear much fruit. That's what he says. And that your fruit should remain. No, I'm not a Calvinist. No. But I do believe that God knew the end from the beginning. And that he knew every choice I would ever make, no matter what the circumstance was. And that he knew that one day I was going to call on his name. And he placed me in Jesus Christ's hands. I believe the same about you, brothers. I believe the same about every one of you sitting here right now. Whether you're paying attention or not, I don't care. You're hearing this. Yeah. Why? Because God has led you to this place. And you are receiving what it is that he is giving. The same, brothers. God has placed you in Christ's hand. None of us knew Christ. We ignored Christ. We didn't know what the feeling of having Christ with us was like or nothing. Only God knew what that was like. None of us knew God. We ignored him. Except Jesus. Jesus knew what that was like. Yeah. One day we will know that. But not today. Yeah. All right. But when we come to Christ, he will reveal what it's like to know God to us. And brothers, that's going to be right here. Right here with that joy and that peace and that strength and that righteousness dwells. That's when you're going to know him. That's how you're going to know him. There will be no mistake, brothers, I promise you. I went around a long time wondering about these spiritual experiences. That's all I'm saying. I wondered about these spiritual experiences. Is this God? Is this the Holy Spirit? Yeah. And brothers, I'll be honest with you. When I had that first spiritual experience, there was no one in anymore. Yeah. All right. That's the revelation. That's the revelation. And those experiences, brothers, will lead you to this spiritual awakening. No doubt about it. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for it is light. It is easy. All I could think about was the things I wasn't ever going to have, what I might have to give up, what I wasn't going to be able to do anymore. And that was a heavy burden. But when I began thinking about what I was doing, yeah, it wouldn't no, I mean, hold candle no more to what I thought I was losing. Because, brothers, you ain't losing anything. You're gaining everything. Everything. Everything that you had need of in this world you have gained. Peace, joy, love, strength, contentment. All these things you have gained in your hearts. Yeah. Are you willing to take on his yoke? Are you willing to be yoked to Christ? Do you know what that is to be yoked? Anybody ever seen two horses together pulling a wagon? Or two oxen pulling a wagon? They got this piece of leather and it goes around the neck of one and it goes over to the other and it goes around the neck of it. And that's what it means to be yoked. That means you're there together doing the same thing. That we must be yoked to Christ. Because his yoke is light. It's not a heavy burden. It's easy, brothers. It's the hardest thing that I ever had to do. And after I did it, brothers, it became the easiest thing that I've ever done. Yeah. I'm not telling you it's easy, brothers. I'm telling you it's hard. But I'm telling you that once you make that choice, once God has been revealed to you, once you feel that within yourself, you'll kick yourself and you'll wonder why it took you this long. You'll regret all that you've missed out on, all the years that you did what you did instead of what God says. Yeah. And then you'll see how easy it really is. Instead of giving up all that you thought you were going to have to give up when you start gaining all that God has for you. This is when you'll understand it, brothers. Alright. Brothers, this is the pathway to perfection. Not my words. I'm not the one telling you that you got to be perfect, brothers. And if you disagree with that, you're not disagreeing with me because I didn't, I'm not the one that wrote this book. You know, I find that people who want to argue with you when you share the scripture with them, they want to tell you, no, that's not it. That's not what it means at all. Like they're arguing with you. 
I didn't write this book. You're not arguing with me. Yeah. Do you understand how it works? Yeah. Or who would you is going to stand up to God's face and tell him he's wrong? That's all I'm asking. Okay. Believe, brothers. Believe. It's time to start believing, man. It's time to start believing, brothers. It's time to start believing in God and Jesus Christ and yourselves. Because God has chosen you out of this world to be his children. Believe that. All things are possible with you. Believe that. Through Jesus Christ now, all things are possible. Do you believe it, brothers? Do you want that? If you do, you haven't hit this water. Come see me after I get this stuff put away, brothers. It's only takes me about 10, 15 minutes to put it away. Yeah. And we're down here, we'll get this in so you can get started on this narrow path. No, it's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy, brothers. But we have a God whose name is Jesus Christ who is there with us the entire way. All we got to do is follow him. That's it. All we got to do is follow him. It's close. Father, we give thanks for this word, Father. Father, it's a hard truth. Father, it's, it's really not something that we want to believe and understand, Father. But we, we know that, Father, it is possible with you, Father. There's nothing impossible with you, Lord. And if you come to dwell within us, if you give us of your spirit, Father, then we know that it is possible, Father. It is possible because you make it possible within us, Lord. Today, Father, we offer our hearts and minds to you, Father, that you would come and dwell within them, Lord, and lead us, Father, through passion and zeal and desire, Father, peace and joy, Lord, to do these things that you are asking of us, Father, because more than anything, Father, we want to be like you. We want to dwell where you are, Father. Lord, let these men live up to you, Lord. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we got some sacrifices, guys.